Oh, hey. Yeah, that's right. Talking Olive. What you might call an attempt at making the next 10 minutes a lighthearted journey for all. So I'm a stuffed Spanish olive. I grew up in California, but I take my heritage pretty seriously. You could say that my motivation stems from the deep Spanish roots of my family tree. Anyway, for culture, beauty, and outright influence in the shape of the world as we know it, Spain enjoys its share. Cervantes, Picasso, Conquistadors, Sherry, St. Ignatius of Loyola, Paella. Ooh, wait, go back one. No, uh, not, not the paella. Ah, oh, I know what you're thinking. Awesome, a happening profile of a saint. Well, Ignatius didn't start off as a saint. As a matter of fact, you could say that he took the scenic route to sainthood. Well, here we are, the castle of Loyola in northern Spain, birthplace of Saint Ignatius. Not the humble beginnings one might imagine for a saint. In 1491, Inigo Lopez de Loyola was born into a family of minor nobility. At age 13, he was sent to live with Juan Velasquez, a family friend, who also happened to be a treasurer in the court of Ferdinand and Isabella. Ignatius the young courtier developed grand visions of chivalry and battlefield glory. He took great care of and pride in his physical appearance and was no stranger to the ladies. In addition to walking around town wearing a sword, he was known to drink, gamble, and even brawl. Yup, he was about as far from a saint as you'd like to get, but hey, he's young, there's still time. By his late 20s, Ignatius found direction and purpose as a respected army officer. Though he was a dedicated and courageous soldier, his lifestyle stayed the same, and his motivation still leaned toward the vain and glorified. Funny enough that it was his appetite for glory that would change his life. Pamplona, May 21st, 1521. Outnumbered 13 to 1 and encouraged by Ignatius, Mayor Miguel Herrera chooses to fight rather than surrender Pamplona to invading French forces. Six hours into the futile battle, Ignatius, leading the effort, is struck by a cannonball that rips open his left calf and shatters his right shin. With their larger-than-life champion gravely wounded, the Spanish troops lose their spirit and surrender. The French were so impressed with Ignatius' skill and bravery that they treated his wounds and carried him home to Loyola. Ah, sorry. This is where things get ugly. Doctors had to re-break and reset Ignatius' leg. After it healed, a protruding bone created a lump, which did not agree with Ignatius' vanity. He had the extra bones sawn off and the shortened legs stretched out with weights. Since the state of medicine in 1521 was soaked rags and rusty saws, and television was a good 450 years off, Ignatius began a very long, painful, and boring recovery. To pass the time, Ignatius read the only two books in the house, The Life of Christ and The Lives of the Saints. Not his first choice by far, but better than nothing. Gradually though, as he reflected for days and months on end upon what he was reading, the thoughts and desires that had always motivated Ignatius were being challenged by an increasing desire to serve Christ in some meaningful way. With his wounds healed and after a lot of contemplation on his place in the world and against his family's protests, Ignatius turns away from a life of wealth, excitement and nobility and decides to travel to the Holy Land to serve pilgrims there. He sets out for the sanctuary at Montserrat, where he confesses his sins for three days, leaves his sword at the altar of the Black Madonna, and trades his fancy clothes for those of a beggar. A penniless drifter, Ignatius finds shelter in a cave in the nearby town of Manresa. Though he has confessed his sins, he struggles with his own humanity, his relationship with God, his ultimate role. Over the course of the next year, as Ignatius meditates on these things, he jots down reflections in his prayer experiences. These notes become the basis for the spiritual exercises, which have allowed millions of people to better understand themselves, each other, and their relationship with God for over 500 years. 
but that's a whole different video. Though he lived with hunger, sickness, and uncertainty throughout his time in Manresa, Ignatius was realizing life-altering truths, the greatest of which came as he rested on the banks of the Cardinair River one afternoon. Staring into the water, he was overcome by an understanding that God was in all things, and that his presence wasn't confined to buildings or ceremonies. This great revelation of the dynamic nature and presence of God in everyday life would be a major founding principle of the Jesuits. More importantly, it motivates Ignatius to stop living in a cave and get going to the Holy Land. By way of Barcelona and Venice, Ignatius lands in the port of Jaffa in August of 1523, and after a short time in Jerusalem, he's sent right back by the Franciscans. They didn't want to be responsible for the safety of a pilgrim do-gooder wandering around an inhospitable city. Back in Spain, Ignatius began to counsel others in the basics of his spiritual exercises. But the Inquisition was on, and the authorities weren't thrilled with the laymen teaching his original concepts. Though eventually set free, he was barred from preaching until he secured some credentials by way of an advanced university degree. See where this is going? Well, Ignatius' childhood education left something to be desired, namely, Latin. So, starting from scratch, 33-year-old Ignatius swallowed his pride and enrolled himself in classes with little kids and teenagers. After two years of being the only student with a beard, Ignatius was ready for college. He got into trouble again at the University of Alcala and was jailed, after when she went to the University of Salamanca. Sort of. Tired of the harassment and lost in the inflexible education structure of Spanish institutions at the time, Ignatius headed off to Paris. At the U of Paris, Ignatius found an entirely different educational experience that stressed progressively building knowledge and active participation throughout a course of study. He also finds like-minded individuals like Francis Xavier and Peter Faber. After completing his studies and being ordained, Ignatius and a handful of buddies set up in Rome. Since the Holy Land was off limits, they decided that the best way to serve would be to form a community at the disposal of the Pope. Though they had never intended on in forming an organized group, on September 27th, 1540, Pope Paul III gave formal approval to the brandy new order of the Society of Jesus. But there was a lot of work to be done, and with only 10 members, the Jesuits knew they would need greater numbers to have a meaningful impact on the world. Knowing the importance of a solid education, Ignatius and the Jesuits opened schools in Europe and Asia to instruct young recruits. By 1548, 10 colleges were turning out hundreds of highly educated young men, and the public took notice. It wasn't long before the Jesuits were asked to open schools for everyone, something they had never anticipated. From then on, the number of Jesuits soared, and Ignatius worked like a dog setting up schools and universities all over the world. So here we are, 28 Jesuit colleges and universities in the United States alone, where students study philosophy, law, medicine, theology, business, film, engineering, you name it. The scope of disciplines reaches back to a letter Ignatius wrote in 1551, stating that those who are now merely students in time will depart to play diverse roles. Their good education in life and doctrine will be beneficial to many others, with the fruit expanding more widely every day. Jesuit institutions require students to look beyond themselves and to participate in a world that could benefit from their talents. So, wondering where you fit into this picture? Segway! Whether a student, professor, or staff member, you're a part of a unique tradition in education that values critical thinking, social responsibility, and personal development for the betterment of all humankind. This isn't just a place to study, teach, or work. It's a state of being that is constantly evolving in concert with the world of which it is part. Well folks, that's the whole story in a nutshell, as told by a small green fruit. You've got a lot to think about, and I've got a bull to fight. Hey, it's a cartoon, I can do anything I want. <laughs>